Hello friends, welcome to episode 2 of Vault Repairs. Today I'm going to take care of this old tape deck here, which was given to me as a gift by a viewer from France a couple of months ago. And for that a big thank you, you know I owe you a lot. It's a Pioneer CTF850, manufactured between 1979 and 1981 in Japan. And that is where my greetings go today, hello to all the viewers from Japan. And this was at the time when the Pioneer Corporation produced a whole range of audio devices, often referred to as the Blue Line or Blue Line series. By now this tape deck is a valuable collector's item, but of course it's more valuable when it actually works. So let's see if it does and if not, what we can do about it. So in order to test the tape deck we would of course normally need an amplifier and two loudspeaker boxes. But instead I'm using this old portable cassette player slash radio here, which I modified a couple of years ago. This shiny thing here, this little jack, is an input jack leading directly to the pre-amplifier section of this device. That means that via an RCA cable and an RCA to 3.5 mm headphone jack adapter, we can feed the output signal from the tape deck directly into the pre-amplifier and listen to the amplified signal from the internal loudspeakers of this portable device. And I have made several videos in which I explained how I add line-in connectors to devices like this. Check the video description for more information. In the background you can also see that I'm using a PC monitor in order to take a look at technical documentation of the tape deck. So let's start testing this thing by first switching it on, opening the dust cover, inserting an ordinary cassette tape, closing the dust cover again and pressing play. So what we can see here is that first both reels start moving, then the right reel suddenly stops, only the left one keeps spinning on, we hear no sound and then a couple of seconds later the entire mechanism just shuts down. So I kept trying this and what I ended up creating of course is what we call Bandsalat in Germany and that means literally translated tape salad. And believe it or not, but there is actually a Wikipedia article about that. So as you can see the tape is twisted and damaged and this goes to show that the mechanical assembly of the tape drive is not working properly anymore and needs to be repaired. But before I will open this device and attempt a repair, I want to check if at least the reader heads and internal electronics of this device still work. And I do that by connecting this tape adapter here, which leads to the headphone jack of the smartphone, play an mp3 and see if we can actually listen to the music this way. So the reader heads, amplifiers and even level meters seem to work just fine. But you can see that the system still shuts down after a couple of seconds. That is most probably not a fault though, but simply because we're using an adapter here that has no actual tape that can be put under tension by the rotation of the reels. These are good signs of course, so let's start to repair this thing. So my analysis here was that after almost four decades, the old rubber belts are simply worn out and I ordered a replacement kit for this exact model on the German eBay website and I put a link to that in the video description. I paid 20 euros for this kit, but I think since this is actually a valuable collector's item, it's worth it. The disassembling process is started by unscrewing four bolts and lifting off the black bonnet or hood covering the electronics inside. And inside we find a rather typical example of Japanese audio electronics from the end of the 1970s, especially these wire wrap connections here that you find mixed with actual plastic connectors, very typical for Japanese equipment, while you rarely ever see these in German audio devices, of which there still were a lot manufactured in the 1970s. 
And here we have the actual mechanical tape drive with the take up reel motor on the right and the capstan motor on the left. But how do we get this entire mechanical system out of here without cutting any of the electrical connections yet have enough space to freely operate on this assembly? Well, it works as follows. First, the tape deck is put on its back panel and then we unscrew three little screws from the bottom and three from the top side of the aluminum front cover and then we can pull it off and what we have to do then is to disconnect one plastic connector and move it through these holes here so that the front panel can completely be freed from the device. And now for the first time we can actually have a closer look at the front of this mechanism itself. What you see here is called a base, to be more precise, the supply reel base. And this one here, this right base, is called the take-up reel base. Then we have two rubber wheels called the pinch rollers and they are attached to little arms and together these parts form pinch roller assemblies. These little metal pins here are called capstans and they are not simply stationary metal pins, they are rotating spindles that are attached to a flywheel and pulleys inside this device, as we see later. And at least according to Pioneer, the fact that this is a dual capstan machine, as can be read on the front panel, is a sign for a good quality tape drive. If you want to know more about that, just read the Wikipedia article about tape transport. In the next step, these four screws here are being removed, and then also some screws on the bottom side of the enclosure. In the next step, the first belt has to be removed. It is connecting this pulley here with the counter and this belt has to be pulled off before the entire mechanical assembly can be taken out of the enclosure. In the next step, this large white plastic connector is unplugged and then this little switch here has to be unscrewed from the mechanism. It serves the purpose of determining if the cassette inside the drive is right protected or not. And it might take you a minute or two to unwind the chaotic mess of wires inside the enclosure until you're able to place this entire mechanical assembly on the table while having the enclosure stand on one of its sides. Now we remove these three screws here holding down this metal sheet carrying this large solenoid here and carefully lift it off the rest of the assembly without loosening any of the wire connections on the back side. Underneath we find a pulley and a large flywheel connected with two rather wide belts. These two wheels are sitting on the two shiny spindles, the two capstans that we saw before. And we now first remove the belt connecting the two and then we remove the belt connecting the capstan motor to the flywheel. Over here we can see that the capstan motor is also connected via another very tiny belt to a little optical encoder similar to what you find inside a modern inkjet printer and this is certainly a closed loop ensuring that the capstan motor's rotational speed is being regulated and kept constant. And in the next step I remove this little belt as well. But in order to do that I had to unscrew the little optical encoder first. In the next step, I now pull out the two capstans out of their bearings and if you do this yourself, pay attention not to lose the little washers sitting on these spindles. And after unscrewing a couple of more screws, we can now finally reach down to the deepest layer inside the mechanism and start to actually replace, not just remove belts. And while working on this, I noticed that maybe in an earlier repair attempt, someone put, well, a very ill-fitting retention ring onto the spindle here. Well, for now it holds, but actually this, I think, is not good craftsmanship. So I will now first remove and replace these two little belts here, and then I will replace all the other belts and put everything back together again in the exact reverse order of what you have seen in the last couple of minutes. And luckily, the seller of this replacement kit here labeled all the little bags. And this one says winder, and that's a little belt that I just removed. And this one says Bandteller rechts nach Zwischenteller 1, and that means right real base to intermediate pulley 1. And that would be this little belt here. 
And after that's done, this entire black plastic piece here holding the real bases and so on is screwed back onto the other part of the mechanical assembly. Now the belt connecting the capstan motor with a little optical encoder is replaced by the belt in the bag saying Zwischenrad 1 nach Zwischenrad 2, which means intermediate pulley 1 to intermediate pulley 2. Also don't forget to screw the optical encoder itself back in place. After that is done, the capstans are reinstalled in their bearings and then the longer of the two wide belts labeled capstan 1 is used to connect the motor to the flywheel and the one in the back capstan 2 is used to connect the two wheels together. Once that is done, you also shouldn't forget to put these two transparent plastic discs here back on the front side of the capstans, which had fallen down once I had pulled the capstans out of their bearings. Now the drive assembly is simply screwed back together, the switch is reattached, the entire assembly is placed back in the enclosure, fastened again, and now the new counter belt is installed, the German bag saying Zwischenrad 2 nach Zählwerk, meaning intermediate pulley 2 to counter. And now everything is simply put back together. So I'd say it's time for the moment of truth. So I'd say that looks pretty much like a major improvement. Now in case you have done this repair yourself and you want to fine tune your machine a little bit, here is a graphic giving you instructions of how you can do that. Now this was the second episode of Vault Repairs, but I think the third episode will be online by the end of next week and I'm also working on other stuff in the new workshop. So in any case, I'll see you guys soon.